I was diagnosed with a very rare form of liver cancer. A pediatric cancer survivor searches for answers. What the heck am I supposed to be doing? Why is all of this happening? See how he found his way and is helping others. God, I need some hope and help me bring hope. Plus, he's a comedian and a Fox News host. Tom Shalhoub reveals how mean dads can make for a better America. All on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, good morning and welcome to the show. Here's a look at this week's top five trending stories from Studio 5. At number five. Thousands packed a football stadium Sunday for what's come to be known as the Super Bowl Sunday of Christianity. Who makes the power of sin in 38,000 filled the Cardinals stadium for Sunday's Harvest America Crusade with performers Mercy Me, Need to Breathe, and Jordan Sparks. Even more gathered at nearly 4,000 churches across the country just to watch. June 12th, the Monday following, how do you measure impact or change when the conference, so the, the crusade is done? Well, uh, for us, you know, our profit margin is people coming to Christ. I wanna help people get ready for heaven. At the stadium alone, nearly 3,000 people invited Christ into their lives for the very first time. Now to number four. Chip Gaines is a fan favorite among faith audiences. Hold on a second, I gotta take this phone call. Mom, yeah, listen. And they're about to get a little more from the HGTV Fixer Upper star, a new book. In his recent Instagram post, Chip said, I've done so many dumb things in my day that I had enough material to write a book. So I did. Coming this fall, Capital Gains, smart things I learned doing stupid stuff. Okay, so I love you too, Mom. I do, I, you think I look thin? Thank you, Mom. Okay, I love you. Chip's book will be released October 17th. Now, number three. All the times that you ran my parade, yeah. Justin Bieber continues to make headlines for his faith. The pop star screenshot the words, I follow Jesus, to his more than 80 million Instagram followers. And it's already seen more than a million likes and encouraging comments. God is good in the midst of the darkness. God is good in the midst of the evil. God is in the midst. No matter what's happening in the world, God is in the midst. And he loves you and he's here for you. At number two. One of the great playoff runs of all time is complete. The Warriors beat the Cavs Monday to win their second championship in three seasons with two men of faith at the helm. World champs again, crazy. Enjoy every minute of it. Steph Curry and MVP Kevin Durant lead the team in a near perfect run. To have teammates that encourage you, that lift you up, that's what we all need in life, you know what I mean? And, and it was it was amazing mm, right now just to, to be here with these guys, man. It's amazing. At number one. You believe what you want. You work your side of the street, and I'll work mine. America's fascination with acting legend Steve McQueen gets two new chapters. This is a story that needs to be told. And one thing Steve said before he died was, my only regret in life is that I was not able to tell people about what Christ did for me. McQueen fan and author Greg Laurie just released a book on McQueen's journey to faith, titled The Salvation of an American Icon. He has a documentary coming in the fall. Here's the story I want to tell. Steve McQueen became a believer in Jesus Christ toward the end of his life. That is a story very few people know, and that is a story I want to tell in this documentary film. But I'm gonna follow Steve's life, and it's gonna be a story like people have never seen before. Well, that was this week's Top 5. If you like the Top 5, then you'll want to watch the show Studio 5. You can watch it on Roku or Apple TV or go to cbn.com forward slash studio five. Well, coming up, a call to dads everywhere, just in time for Father's Day. Comedian Tom Shalou shares how old fashioned childhood with simple American values shaped his life right after this.
Well, comedian Tom Shalhoub grew up in the 70s, but says it felt more like the 50s. He says there's something to be said about old-fashioned conservative values. Take a look. Comedian and Fox News host Tom Shalhoub says good old respect has gone the way of the dinosaur. Raised in Norwood, Massachusetts, in a large Irish Catholic family, Tom says his parents kept him grounded with love for God, country, and family. In his book, Mean Dads for a Better America, Tom shares funny childhood stories while addressing serious issues on the forefront of every parent's mind today. Well, Tom joins me now, and thanks for being here. Thanks, Gordon. All right, let's get into your childhood. You say that your dad was Darth Vader, um, which is kind of scary. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> what he, he, he would scare you. He, me and my brother were afraid of my dad. He would wake us up on Saturday morning with his breathing. And really? he'd say, get in the car. And we'd run downstairs, we'd get in the car. We I'm jumped. I'm he got up before you. <laughs> exactly. He did. <laughs> Early to rise. And then he'd get us in the car and drive us somewhere. And we didn't know where we were going. There he is. That's, mm. you know, him and his young, young days. And, uh, but, you know, you look at him now and you think, oh, he doesn't look scary. And, my, you know, my kids, they say, Dad, what are you, what are you writing about, you know, Grandpa Shalou like this for? He's such a nice old man. But I try to tell mm. these stories from the perspective of a little kid. And we were afraid of my dad. We were afraid to speak back to him. And, uh, you know, he was the kind of dad I always say, a lot of young people, I think, you know, you guys get the book. You see the title and you see the humor in it immediately. But a lot of young people that I've been oh, talking yeah. to, they say, what do you mean? You mean abusive dads are good? And I say, you got to know the difference. Because a mean dad, in my book, it said tongue in cheek. Because mean dads, they know when to be mean in the service of raising good children. And that's what it's about. Well, what do you think the impact is, though, uh, from, from, a, from, I guess, a, a society standpoint? Because I don't think we have mean dads anymore. Uh, I think I, we have helicopter parents yes. that are trying to watch out and keep kids from trouble and, and make sure they have a perfect life. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think the impact of that will be? Well, I think that we, we need to take a little bit of the mean dad philosophy from the past and bring it forward. You know, I was on the playground recently, I'm raising my kids in the Bronx, and I said to one of my daughters, she was having a little tantrum, and I said, she said something about her feelings. I said, I don't care how you feel, I care how you behave. And one of the other parents looked at me. It was a New York mom, she kind of looked at me. She said, where'd you get that? And I said, I think my mom used to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, again, it's, I tell that story, and the idea is that of course, I care how my kids feel, but I want them to know that behavior comes first. I think a lot of times people put it in the other order now. They start with the feelings first. But in my family, be behavior came first, you know, and, and there, it wasn't abusive. We knew our parents loved us. My dad mm -hmm. used to reach for the belt, but he never used it. He never had to use it because, you the know, threat was we enough. jumped, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, are, are, are you worried about America going forward? I try not to worry. The, really? the book is optimistic. You know, I, I like to put a positive spin on things. That's why when I look back, I want to look back at these stories and I want to laugh. And I want people to look at these stories and laugh at the way my parents did it. Because we're not going to do everything the way they did. I would say, you know, we're not going to... My mother tied me to a tree so I wouldn't run in the street. I had a little harness that was tied to a tree. And she wanted to keep me safe and she had to get housework done. She was very busy. She had five kids. So she tied me to a tree, a simple solution. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tie my kid to a right, tree. But well, let's, let's correct us. She tied you to a harness, and you were free to run around. Exactly. I run around the tree. <laughs> in That's a not circle. being tied to a tree. Well, no, she didn't. Exactly. I like this. That's being tethered. To exactly. A tree. <laughs> I was tethered. You're right. It was like, and I would go in a little circle, you know. But the thing is that today. I bet you wore a path around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you see, you know, parents today, there's an argument over. They have little kids in the airport, and they, they want to keep them safe, so they have them on a harness. And people look at them, and they say, shame on you. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's just a solution. It's just keeping it's the just, kids safe. Yeah, yeah it's you know? keeping them within reach. Though. Yes. You can go so, so far, but you can't go too far. Yes, and it's the political correctness. It's gone so far, and parents hover over their kids. So the thing is, I was very disciplined. So when I say mean dads, it really is tongue-in-cheek because my parents were tough, and my mom was the kind of mom who would say, if a kid bullied me, she'd say, well, hit him back. Go out there and work it yeah. out. So we had to work things out. The thing is that we were disciplined, but we weren't hovered over. When you told them you got in a fight, were they proud of you? Yeah. She said, go hit him back, and I did. And you know what? I hit him back, and then, uh, let's face it, I lost that fight. He kind of beat me up. But <laughs> I went home, <laughs> and I had bruises, but I had stuck up for myself. Right. 
and he didn't pick on me again. Right, I bet the bully remembered that. Yes, you know, and I that's how. I don't want to pick a fight with him. Right, and so we learned that way. Our parents, they had the faith to, to have us learn our own tough lessons, you know, and they weren't that tough. I always say, my parents' parents, they were meaner than them. Go back through history, every dad was meaner going back, you know. Well, but, I just went through the, my family history, and I discovered that, that, you know, I, I took it back to the Civil War, and I looked at the family history and what, what these people were like, and then you go through the photographs and how they lived, yeah. and I go, that was hard. Yeah. I mean, that, that was really hard. Exactly. I always say, look at those old photographs. Do the wife and children look anything but terrified of that no, man in the they, derby hat? They don't look happy either. I mean, they, you see the photographs, and I guess it's, you have to sit still. Yeah. And so nobody's, you know, everybody's got this grim face. And yes. And so I think that I, I'm, I am optimistic about the future. You know, if hmm. we think of, if we value, you know, families instead of everyone's obsessed with the, 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 their online image and their, their devices and, you know, sometimes the world, it gets a little crazy and we have to look inward and we can, we can improve the world through our families, I think, you know, it's family time. And I always remind my kids of that, that, you know, you look at me there and you say, come on, you're not a mean dad, but I, you're I mean, mean when I, you, you look at that ice cream, ice cream. Ice oh, cream. Yeah. two scoops there, but I mean when I have to be, and they know that, um, That's just one big scoop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How much does that cost now? A scoop of ice cream? But you're you know, spoiling them. They know. They know when. Uh, they know when I am mean. They know that I'm trying to raise them right. And I think. Um, but have we lost family? Uh, I, I, yes. I look at America today, and, and the dominant household now is a single parent. Yeah. And it's, you know, uh, the thing is that, that that's another message. It's not just, um, you know, it, it's not all about, you know, mean dads and disciplining your kids. It's about having kids. And I tell all mm -hmm. my friends, you know, I'm a comedian. You know, th there's a lot of ne'er-do-wells out there. And I was one, too. You know, I, I got married later. I didn't have my first uh, child till I was 40. But I, at that point, I, after we had kids, I said to my wife, what were we doing? What did we do for all this? How many dinners can you have? You know, so I say to these these uh, New York comic friends of mine, I say, just get married. And they say, well, you know, I, I haven't found the right girl. And I say, you know, go, we'll go out and seek them, find them, get married, have kids. Stop this nonsense. Everyone they're they're worried that they're not going to have enough pleasure in their life, mm -hmm. but they're not really happy. I mean, I wasn't really happy till I got married and had kids. And then I look back and I said, what was I after for that decade, that lost decade you know, trying to be a single man in New York. Well, to my amazement, I'm now looking. I'm, I have an older brother, and he's got grandkids. And I'm now looking, and my, my kids haven't gotten married yet. And I'm like, can you hurry this along? <laughs> uh, I really want to be a granddad. Yeah. And I want that, that feeling of the generations. Yeah. That, yeah, we're going to go forward. There's, that's the thing. It's, it's another thing that uh, and a lot of Americans are doing. And, and it's Europe as well. They're, they're delaying this. Uh, they're at, they, first of all, they delay their adolescence till mm -hmm. their 30s. And then they delay their this kind of adulthood when they're trying to be singles and swiping right and all this other stuff until their 40s. And then at that point, it's kind of like, uh, oh, what was I doing all this time? And it's it, that's why we don't have the big families anymore. I grew up in a big family. And when my parents weren't around, I was disciplined by my brothers oh, and yeah. sisters. And they'd keep you in line. Yeah. Yeah. So. And they'd rat you out, too. Yeah. <laughs> and I like, I mean, this is why. And, and I'm starting to see it in my world. I, I'm starting to see bigger families. And, you know, I toured the country with Jim Gaffigan. He's got five mm -hmm. kids, and I'd have my kids, and we'd all go out together. And, uh, and there's a lot of chaos. families out there. Yeah, it's chaos, but it's a, a blessed chaos. Yeah, and it's wonderful chaos. Yeah. So get out there. Get married. Have kids. <laughs> there you go. Have your kids have kids. Have grandkids. And be a mean dad for a better America. The book is called Mean Dads for a Better America, The Generous Rewards of an Old-Fashioned Childhood and it's available for wherever books are sold. And Tom, thanks for being Thank here. Thank you so much, yeah. yeah, appreciate it. Well, up next, Building Hope for Kids Battling Cancer. Where they should be dreaming and thinking about pirate ships and playgrounds, now everything is replaced with hospital visits, needle pricks, and chemos that make you so sick that you can't stand it. See how this pediatric cancer survivor is changing the lives of others when we come back. Pediatric cancer survivor Eric Newman was so sure his cancer would return that all he focused on was partying and surfing. But that all changed as he was laying on a hammock in Costa Rica. Take a look. 
When I was three years old, I was diagnosed with a very rare form of liver cancer, hepatoblastoma. So I fought it, went through chemotherapy for about two years and got put into remission. And then my dad's sister, second child, three years old, was diagnosed with leukemia and her name was Shannon. Shannon fought the battle just like I did till she was five and got put into remission. So you fast forward a little bit more, um, Shannon, I believe she was close to 16. We were going through high school, I just graduated. Mom calls me and tells me that Shannon had fallen out of remission. Shannon passed away right around her 17th birthday. And I'll never forget at that moment when we laid her to rest, I just made a decision I was gonna work hard, party hard and play hard, because I believed that the cancer was gonna come back and get me. And I was traveling the world, big time surfer. And I had everything that the world said that I should have, because that's what I had been chasing. And in 2008, the economy kind of took a turn and everything that the world said that I should have, the world wanted it back because I ran out of money. So I did what any responsible businessman would do. I drained my bank account, went to Costa Rica. And when I was there, um, I just prayed for the very first time. I was on a hammock uh, on the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. And I was like, man, what the heck am I supposed to be doing? Why is all of this happening? In the journal, all that I did was write a word hope. That's the only word that it could come. And I just prayed, I said, I said, God, I need some hope and help me bring hope. And so came back, one of my buddies was like, hey man, why don't we throw a fundraiser for a local children's hospital? So we did that, ended up raising close to $7,000. And with me being a childhood cancer survivor, they allowed me to take one of those large checks and present it. And as the elevator was getting ready to close, another group of individuals got in and they had a big check too. Lo and behold, it was a huge grocery store. Their check was for like 1.3 million. I was like, what the heck, man? So I kind of threw the check off to the side and I went and sat um, in a little video game station. And I saw a little guy and started playing the video game with him. And the mom came over and like, what are you doing here? Why are you sitting next to my child? And so for the very first time, I had spoke about the pediatric cancer and she started to cry. Then her husband came over and she's like, tell him the story. And then he started to cry. They said that you give me and my husband hope that my son will be sitting in your seat one day. And at that moment, I knew that I was put here for all the construction stuff that I went through, the turmoil and that, and all the cancer turmoil that I went through that, I needed to marry those two together. Ended up taking a couple of my buddies out to an Italian restaurant. I had to borrow the money from my parents to take them out and just pitch the idea. And one of them had just graduated from law school and he's like, I'll help you do it. And so we filed the 501c3 paperwork for Rock Solid, and that went through the very first time. Rock Solid Foundation is a nonprofit organization that builds hope for children that are dealing with pediatric cancer. Easiest way to explain it is kids one through eight, we put a custom swing set in their backyard, and eight to 18, we go in and remodel their bedrooms. It's over probably 225 projects that we've been able to complete. The most rewarding part of I think what I get the opportunity to do when that child comes around the corner for the very first time and that look on the face that's what hope looks like when a child's diagnosed with pediatric cancer one of the first things that's stripped from them is the ability to play to where they should be dreaming and thinking about pirate ships and playgrounds now everything is replaced with hospital visits needle pricks and chemos that make you so sick that you can't stand it but for us, what we're able to do is we bring play back into the equation. And it's, you look at Papa Bear, and then he's looking at Mama Bear. And for that moment, they're a normal family. And it's, even if it's for those three seconds, that's why we do every single thing in Rock Solid Foundation. It's not about Eric Newman. It's not about Rock Solid Foundation. It's about bringing hope to a pretty desperate situation. Really, I'm showing the love of Jesus and that I get to be able to sit down with them at their worst moment of their entire life and just listen to them. Um, cancer affects every walk of life. And so what it does, it gives me the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ in every situation possible. Be the hands and feet of Christ. I love that. I love the image. I love the story. Here he is thinking, I, I don't have any hope. What's, what's the point of doing anything? Let's just go. Uh, surf the world, and while he's laying in a hammock, he says, uh, you know, hope, where, where, where's hope? And then he comes back and just starts with the idea. Uh, started small, 
And most great ideas do start very small. And very big oak trees come from very small acorns. When you start moving and saying, I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and you find a problem and say, what can we do about this problem? I may not be able to solve all of it, but can I solve a little bit of it? Can I solve it for one family, for one child, for one person? Then amazing things happen. So get inspired by this. And how can you make a difference in the world today? How can you go out and help somebody today? Just sit, sit there and think of it. And then ask God, what, what can I do? And get inspired and see how God can use you. Well, if you want more information about Rock Solid Foundation, all you have to do is go to their website, rocksolidfoundation.org. Well, still ahead, a boy who thought was thought to be cursed and then later bullied into dropping out of school. Hear how he got a new life right after this. Jenna was teased by his classmates and abandoned by his parents. He often wondered if he was treated poorly because of a sin he committed. The truth was, Jenna hadn't done anything wrong. He was just born with a cleft lip. Jenna's parents told him that he had to stay with his grandparents while they looked for a way to pay for his cleft lip surgery, but they never returned. He always asks us, what sin did I commit? Will you ever be able to get my surgery done? Chinna's grandfather couldn't afford to pay for the surgery. But what hurt him the most was when Chinna dropped out of school because of the constant teasing. When I went to school, the kids kept calling me monkey face. They would say, if you touch us, we will also become like you. Then, a neighbor whose son was given a free cleft lip surgery by CBN told us about Chana. We gave Chana the good news that he would also get a free operation. Not long after the surgery, we visited Chana and found out that he had returned to school. Now, I'm very happy. I look normal like all the other kids. It feels good knowing that he is doing well in school. CBN also wanted to help Chana's grandparents make a better income, so we gave them some goats. We will breed and multiply the goats. I will be able to provide for my family and buy my grandson new clothes, books, and anything else he needs for school. You gave me a free surgery for my lip and my grandparents the goats. Thank you very much. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that. Just imagine being a boy growing up in India, and, and, and where do you go? With You've got a medical problem. Uh, it's a birth defect, and what do you do with it? Your parents leave you. Uh, the children in school don't even touch us because we're afraid that uh, our, you'll, you'll give it to us. Uh, where do you go with that? Well, you need help. You need people to come together and say, Yes, I want to help you. I want to be a part of the solution to this problem. And it's wonderful when people get together and say, how can we do something? How can we make a difference in the world? Well, if you're a member of the 700 Club, you're doing that. And it's not just in India. It's in the Philippines. It's in China. Uh, it's around the world where we're providing special surgeries for those who need them. And whether it's cleft palates or orthopedic surgeries, uh, hernias, the, these things that people just can't afford it. But when you do it for them, you give them a hope and a future. So if you're not a member, I invite you to join right now. How much is it? It's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. And you join with tens of thousands of people that say, yes, I want to make a difference. I want to be a part of helping people around the world. A portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International to preach the gospel around the world. And it's all made possible because people like you care enough to give. So if that's you, if that's what you want to do, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, or 
or you can log on to 700clubinteractive.com. And when you call and join, I've got something for you. It's a wonderful DVD teaching with real-life testimonies of people who have experienced miracles. And then there's a teaching from my father, his 55 years of, of ministry experience, teaching you how to get miracles in your life. Get it now, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word for you, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. God bless you, we'll see you again tomorrow.